He is Michael Rinks, the park manager at Rough River Dam State Park, Resort Park. He has been there since 2009 when he was business manager. He's a native of Western Kentucky, born in Paducah and raised in Hawkinsville. He's a graduate of DePaul University in, in Indiana with a Bachelor of Arts in History. He worked for Pepsi-Cola for almost 30 years and was Director of Operations at the International Bluegrass Museum before coming to state parks. He and his wife Sheila reside on the park. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Ricks. Talk uh, if you might like to look at the original plans for the dam and the park that are on that table right there. And we also have a binder that has photos and things like that. Uh -oh. Things that happened have happened there in the past. Well, I appreciate it very much. Uh, it, I am a Kentuckian, uh, all the way Kentuckian. Uh, my, uh, my Mother's side of the family comes from the Ballard County area down there and then on in Paducah. My dad's side of the family, uh, actually the Rick's name came up from North Carolina and settled in around Dover, Tennessee and then came on into Tree County there. So my father's a 1946 graduate of Tree County High School. and uh, that, But we have uh, a lot of history. I graduated from DePaul University with a degree in history. Originally it was going to be pre-law, and just decided I didn't like lawyers that much, so I uh, studied to be a teacher, and I don't, are there any teachers or retired teachers in the room? Okay. I did my student teaching in 7th and 8th grade. I went into business instead of teaching. <laughs> uh, my supervising teachers uh, and I both agreed that uh, it was probably best if I either looked for higher education or somehow moved out of seventh and eighth grade, but it never stopped my love of history. I had a great history teacher in eighth grade, had wonderful professors at DePaul University, and uh, actually my field was more middle America history, and since then I'm, I'm more into military history. Um, I'm a big student of World War II, both, and a vast library. That's my one passion and one vice, I guess you could say, is. I've got more books than I can ever, but I've read them all two or three times. But one of the things since coming to the parks that's been really important, because I like <coughs> to study things, I like to know where it comes from. And one of the things through history that's always amazed me are people's passion. What's the genesis of the idea that gets the ball rolling? And the courage that people have and the vision that people have that gets things started, that we sometimes just maybe take for granted, you know, how did, who came up with the idea, and how did it grow to the point that it is. These are some little things, we don't use these placements anymore, but this, this, and please put them there, those are the state parks of Kentucky. Right now, um, our mission statement at state parks, and what I'm going to try to do is just kind of give you a word of state parks, because this happens to be the 50th anniversary of our park. Uh, the actual dedication of the lodge came in November 1st of uh, uh, 50 years ago. So this is our anniversary coming up. But the state parks themselves have a deep and rich, rich history. We're still true to our mission statement. The mission statement is to protect the beauty, the natural resources, and the history of Kentucky and its parks, and to provide recreational opportunities for the citizens of the state and tourism opportunities for the visitors to our state. That's what the State Parks mission statement is. There's 50 state parks. There's 17 resort parks, and then there's 33 recreation and or historical parks that are out there. And it's the depth and variety of what we have to offer that makes a huge difference. All the way from the western part of the state, at Wycliffe Mounds, Columbus, Belmont, over to the eastern part of the state, you have Jenny Wiley, you have Fish Trap Lake. There's all sorts of variety and beauty and history that's encompassed in the Department of Parks in Kentucky. We tout that we are the nation's finest. And 
and we'll talk a little bit about that. But it didn't just come from overnight. But the 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 state parks, in addition to what they are, if you can take a pencil and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but you got to look at where the state parks are. The state parks generate revenue somewhere around $65 million a year. But if you drew a line around every state park, a circle around every state park, think of the periphery business. Those businesses that are close to and located around state parks, such as the businesses here in Litchfield, businesses up in Parkinsburg, that benefit from having its millions upon millions of dollars are generated by the state parks. But how did we get here? How did somebody have this vision of get to, to get this going? Well, it's a story that includes a lot of different people. A lot of different entities. Entities such as the DuPont family, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Army Corps of Engineers, the CCC, the WPA, normal citizens just like you and I, of course politicians, governors, commissioners, and about anybody else, and the first and only president of the Confederate States of America. All of that ties into the history of the Kentucky State Parks. But if you really want to look back to the first person, there was a fellow by the name of Dr. Willard Rouse Gilson. He was the state geologist. And he and a number of his peers began pressing local officials, state officials, with the idea that, and this, you got to figure, this is in 1924, in the early 20s, okay? There had been a growth in national parks. Impetus, I think, Theodore Roosevelt really started the ball rolling with national parks. And so parks were becoming, there, there were city, city parks. Every city had great parks. Louisville had wonderful parks designed by Frederick Law and said. So the parks were a great idea, uh, but it really hadn't been taken. And Dr. Gilson and his peers recognized the innate beauty of Kentucky and the wonderful historical sites and stories that were part of the fact that Kentucky is as old a state as it is and played such a huge um, plan or a huge portion of the growth of the United States as it is. So he pressed and he and his people pressed and, and they recognized this. They said a number of justly famous natural areas that are seen as outstanding reasons for a well-organized and statewide public park movement in this state. So in 1924, they were able to convince the legislature that indeed, we did need a Department of Parks, or we needed some state parks out there. And the General Assembly actually got together and formed a Kentucky State Parks Commission consisting of three appointed commissioners, Dr. Gilson being the chairman of that commission. Now, they didn't give me any money, but they appointed a commission. So Dr. Gilson said he, that's, he has carte blanche. He can go do what he wants to do to try to raise interest and to, to really put forth his idea of how the state parks should go. So he travels the state, and he picks out places that are, he feels like, conducive, things that need to be preserved, uh, things that need to be uh, enhanced, things that could make wonderful parks. And in his discussions out there, the people of Kentucky responded. Um, within the first couple of years, uh, his efforts had some notable successes. The people of Bell County, very far-sighted individuals, obviously, donated the land that would become Pine Mountain State Park. Louisville and Nashville Railroad Company donated some 137 acres at a little place it's possibly one of the most beautiful places we have in the state, Natural Bridge in Powell County. And the state also acquired 35 acres known as Pioneer Memorial Park, or Old Herod Hill, uh, in Harrodsburg. That was the site of Fort Herod. And then, finally, uh, in that first period of time, there were the state acquired 85 acres in Todd County, known as Blue Green Park. So when, uh, which that in itself, this is some great trivial pursuit in fact. Okay, That's where a group headed by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, 
the sons of the Confederate veterans and the members of the Kentucky Orphans Brigade, which, by the way, anybody Civil War historian or buff, Kentucky Orphans Brigade is very, is, is, they were an orphan brigade. They fought on the Confederate side, but uh, they were never truly attached to any Confederate division, and they were treated like stepchildren the whole time, hence the Kentucky Orphans Brigade. But they got together uh, because Jeff Davis was born in Fairview, Kentucky. And this group decided that there needed to be a monument to Jefferson Davis. So they built, and here is your trivia question, it is 351 foot tall, and it is a concrete obelisque that was poured. It was not stones that were stacked. It was poured layer by layer by layer. And they got it together. It took them from 1917, I think, to 1924 to build it. To, to build it. When they were done, I think they must have got tired because they basically sold it to the state for a song. But that became one of the first state parks that was recognized is at Fairview, Kentucky, Jefferson Davis Monument, one of the, one of the very first state parks. So this, uh, shortly after the establishment of the state parks, then in 1926, Dr. Gilson went back, that's the next legislative session, he went back to the session, he had all this stuff to report. And, the, and, the, and the, the legislature, the assembly, was very enthusiastic. So they appointed him, it, it became then, uh, he's, he, they outlined his duties as commissioner. They told me he was commissioner before, but now they outlined his duties, which is kind of nice. If you've got a job, you might as well know what you're supposed to do. Uh, but they said his duties were to the examination of available park sites, Suggestions for methods of obtaining these sites, either by gift of land or by popular subscription. And they gave him $1,100 to do it with. <laughs> so he was, he was set and ready to roll with his $1,100. But things continued to happen. He, it was obviously a vision, an idea that touched the people of Kentucky. And We've always been rooted very deeply in our, in our history, and we're proud of our history as Kentuckians. And consequently, a lot of the first parks were historical parks. Uh, shortly after the enactment of the first state, Kentucky State Parks, the state received a donation of 32 acres that contained the site of Blue Licks Battlefield. Anybody know what, anything about Blue Licks Battlefield? See, I'm a historian, but I'll never be a really good historian because I'm too enthusiastic, and I always root for the good guy. And sometimes good guys just don't win all the time. <laughs> but it bores me if I have to deal with evil all the time. But Blue Licks Battlefield, I see I grew up, this also saddens me, because Blue Licks Battlefield, anybody, Fess Parker, Daniel Boone, oh, who watched it on TV growing up, what was his son's name? Anybody remember? Elijah? Or Israel. Israel. Remember Israel? Well, Blue Licks Battlefield was one of the last battles of the Revolutionary War. Uh, a group of Kentucky militiamen fought off a group of British soldiers, Canadian Rangers, and Native American Indians, and Daniel Boone's son Israel was killed at that battle. Seventy militiamen were killed at that battle. That's at Blue Licks. And the land was donated, and the Kentucky General Assembly appropriated $10,000 for the construction of a monument to commemorate that sacrifice. So that was an addition to the state park right there, Blue Licks Battlefield. And for anybody that wants to know, there is a reenactment of that every year, and it's very excellent. And they had, there is a resort park down there at Blue Licks now. But not off to a bad start, you know, when you consider, uh, when the legislature received Jillian's first report, it was enthusiastic. There was already three historical parks, and there was some beautiful acreage for other parks. And uh, the assembly created the position of park commissioner at the full hour, the full powers as a true agency of state government. And then they still didn't have any money because he was working under the governor and the governor had to pay him out of in governor contingency funds. It sounds, uh, it sounds eerily like it's a continuing theme with the legislature that they give you a job to do but not a whole lot of stuff to do it with. But again, not a bad start. In 1928, Governor Flynn Sampson report, uh, appointed a Mrs. James Duval as director of state parks. She was also extremely enthusiastic. She traveled across the state, and in addition, she conducted the business of parks and kept just meticulous records. Her greatest accomplishment was the completion of Pioneer Memorial Parks at Harrisburg. They actually built replicas of the walls, 
the block houses, the cabins for the fort. They completed that or got it in very, very good shape and opened that as a state park. That is, uh, it was already a state park, but opened that to the general public and it became a wonderful place to go. She also traveled to Washington to press Congress for $100,000, $100,000 grant or appropriation to complete that memorial, a suitable memorial, and was successful in that. So Fort Herod became a, a huge place that people visited. So about this time, Kentucky began to realize that maybe this tourism would be a good deal. You know, we get people in the state, they spend their money in our state. That's a novel idea. And so they started to promote themselves, and one of the first areas that they did was a magazine called Kentucky Progress Magazine. And in the first edition in 1928, uh, they listed special places to visit in Kentucky, and Kentucky State Parks figured very uh, largely in that, and then also in the ensuing editions uh, that came out. In the 1930s, I mentioned the name DuPont. Now, whether or not that's part of the DuPont family or not, I don't know, but there was a Delaware senator who was born in Kentucky, moved to Delaware, and, and served the United States Senate by the, by the name of Senator Coleman DuPont. And he left a bequest to the State Park Commission of $400,000. That's in 1930. What happened in 1929? So it's pretty amazing that that would, would happen. And then in addition to that, January 31st, or January of 1931, his widow presented another, presented the commission of a 500-acre tract she had purchased around Majestic Cumberland Falls as a gift to the state parks. Uh, also in 1931, four other parks became part of the ever-expanding system, Levi Jackson, Dr. Thomas Walker, Old Mulkey Meeting House, and General Butler. Again, three properties that had historical significance. General Butler does too, if anybody's ever toured up there, there's some wonderful architecture, the old home up there. So looking back into history. So in the 30s were amazing time for the parks. You know, in the midst of the Great Depression, the parks actually grew. Uh, and one of the reasons that we benefited so much was because of the Depression, there were two organizations that were formed to give people work. There was the CCE, the Civilian Con Conservation Corps, and there was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Those were government-run, federal-run programs which put the people to work because nobody had jobs. And they were a wonderful boon to roads, to courthouses, to bridges, to a lot of government facilities, but not only federal, Kentucky was able to use them to work on their state parks. And even in the midst of the Depression, this was huge. We, trails were created in the parks, cut, marked, uh, campgrounds were constructed, picnic areas were constructed, roads were built, lodges were actually built at Natural Bridge, Cumberland Falls, Pine Mountain, and James J. Alvin. And the CCE and the WPA built roads, landscaped, and renovated the, dis the dispensary at Columbus Belmont, which is over in the far western part of the state. Columbus Belmont is where General Polk, Confederate general, held off General Ulysses S. Grant. And there was a battle out there, and the dispensary was that. So that's, that became part of the state park system, and they renovated that. So during the late 20s and early 30s, additional parks were added, like my old Kentucky home, Perryville Battlefield, site of a civil, uh, civil War battle. And then William Whitley House, Constitution Square, all of those were added. So by 1934, we're talking a short span of 10 years, we have gone to 14 parks with an estimated value of 1.55 million, and that's in 1930s. So that's, put that in today's terms, that's huge. What an accomplishment over a short period of time that we did that. Parks were recognized and the government and the, they became the division of parks and were transferred to the Department of, of Conservation and they had a budget of $23,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving up in the world now. Uh, in 1936, Governor A.B. Happy Chandler appointed one of the finest parks directors. His name is General Bailey Wootney. And his accomplishments were the restoration of the Whitley House uh, and the building of the Audubon Museum, which if anybody has taken the time to go over there, is truly uh, one of the gems of Kentucky 
but he also wouldn't also spearhead the planting of tens of thousands of trees on all state park property. Walnuts, hickories, all natural and native to the state of Kentucky. And during his administration, trees were planted everywhere. And of course, many of those trees on the parks are still, you know, coming to coming of age. Um, but he said, Wooten said that by 1938, we had 20 parks in the system and an accumulative value of 3.3 million dollars by, by 1938. And Wooten said, well, except for some more historical parks and maybe some shrines, we pretty much reached saturation. He didn't see us growing anymore. And, uh, but he did an amazing job while he was there. Well, the saturation point he was talking about was kind of exasperated because we entered World War II. And uh, World War II, the whole nation's, everything was focused on World War II. The state parks did not grow. It was a struggle even to get appropriations to keep them going the way they were. But they did their part. They housed soldiers. There was training on state park property. And so they did their part for in World War II. But, and we still had visitors. In Kentucky Living Magazine, Natural Bridge was recognized for its hay fever relief qualities. What a wonderful place to go, especially right now. I don't know about you, but my sinus is going to kill me about that yeah. week and a half. But the 40s, once we got past the war, the 40s brought on two more entities which have meant the largest part of the growth of the state park system. That would be the Corps of Engineers and the Tennessee Valley Authority. The Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, at, at that period of time, um, Kentucky Lake was just being finished. The last locks and everything were put on the Tennessee River and Kentucky Lake was finished. The TVA transferred 1,400 acres to the state and that became Ken Lake. And then the state acquired, when they were building Kentucky Lake, actually building it, they built a village to house the workers to build Kentucky Lake. Kentucky Dam Village, which is now KDB. The state purchased that property, so those two minutes were in. In a far-sighted look, the, the state legislature did appropriate $450,000 to develop both of those parks. And by the time that Earl C. Clements became governor, the stage was set for huge further expansion. The 50s saw Kentucky, during the 50s, after World War II, the greatest generation, the people that came home, uh, their families, they vacationed. And during the Eisenhower administration, the highway system was improved immensely and people traveled and people went to state parks. The 50s, where there was huge growth in state park usage and utilization as people took their families there. And it's, we continued to grow. We saw more additions to the system during the 50s, Lake Cumberland, uh, General Burnside, Kincaid Lake, they all became operational. In the 60s, the state park system had grown so large that the legislature created a new agency, created the Kentucky Department of Parks. They also created a three-member board to act as an advisory to them, and that three-member board, they were only in existence for four years, but they did the studies. They did the, quote, lobbying. They did whatever it took because the $10 million general obligation bond was approved for parks to improve and to progress and to grow, and using that funding, such places as Big Bone Lick, Fort Boonesboro, Lake Barkley, Lake Malone, Barron River, Greenbow Lake, and Rough River were brought into the system because of that $10 million bond. So the state park system had developed by the mid-60s into one of the into the premier park system, arguably, in the nation. And that's an amazing for a state, that's a really amazing thing for a state like Kentucky because we're not the most populous state and certainly don't have the most money. But we, what we do have is a beautiful, beautiful state and a lot of rich, rich history to deal with. So that brings us to our park, which uh, uh, is, I have grown to love. I grew up in West Kentucky and spent a lot of time at Barkley, at Ken Lake. Actually, probably spent more time at Penarau than anywhere else because of its proximity to Hopkinsville down there. But the first time I came to this park, I was, uh, it, I was struck by the natural beauty. We've only got 600 acres. It's not a big park. 
Uh, some of the other parks have thousands of acres, you know, 1,500, but as for resort parks, we're the very smallest in acreage. But we're the largest in percentage of utilization for those acres because we have a lot, a lot of visitors. The Corps tracks those visitors, and every time you drive across those little counters out there, it counts to over a million a year. They come to our park. Now, a lot of those are employees probably just running back <laughs> but no, we, we get a huge amount of visitors out there. But to understand how the growth of the state parks came after that, you have to really understand about the Corps of Engineers. And my grandfather retired from the Corps of Engineers. My grandfather started out at Lock E on the old Cumberland. No. Yeah, on the old Cumberland. And then when they, uh, he transferred and became lock master of Kentucky for years and ran that lock. And when they built Barkley, he was lock master at Barkley and uh, spent many, many years with the Corps, so I'm what you'd call a Corps baby. My dad worked on the river on a tugboat, and, which was a good thing because my mom was a secretary for the tugboat company and I'd never be around if they hadn't worked together. <laughs> and he married the secretary. <laughs> but uh, that's, I grew up on the rivers and the lakes, but the Corps of Engineers is very important. To understand the Corps, you've got to go back, and I don't want to, how am I doing on time here, okay? Uh, you're fine. Okay. This short history of the Corps. Corps of Engineers is very important. Anything about the Army, engineers are valued. They know how to build fortifications. They know how to build roads. They know how to get things done. In the Army, the very best and the brightest, and the Corps dates back to before War of 1812, but in the early portion of the Corps, in the 1800s, when the Army, if, uh, between wars, all the best and the brightest of the officers that graduated from West Point went to the Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. And because they were charged with improving the transportation systems in the United States. So in the event of war, we could get our soldiers here and there around. They also improved fortifications. But early on, they were working on transportation systems, which is not just roads, although they did, did build a national road across the Alleghenies and into Ohio. They supervised that simply because they couldn't get any civilian people to bid the job right, so they assigned it to the Corps of Engineers. The Corps was also involved in the most important transportation asset that this country has always had, and that would be our rivers. In the 1800s, you didn't get anywhere unless you traveled by river, because there weren't any roads. Hence, the Cincinnati's, the Louisville's, the Paducah's, the Memphis's, where all the metropolises grew up on the river, because that's where the major transportation, not only for people, but for goods, back and forth. The Corps was very early on, I mean, in the 1830s, 1840s, they were already dredging channels. They were building canals. Um, the Erie Canal system was partially designed by Corps of Engineer personnel. It's built by private money, but they used some Corps designs. But the Corps' life began in improving rivers. And because of the nature of the river, the floods came every year. People built their own dikes. Farmers built levees. States built levees to try to protect some of their property from the annual floods. Okay. Well, after the early 19 into the 1920s, with some of the massive, massive historical floods, I think in Paducah it was 1929 was the historical flood that just flooded all of downtown Paducah. The Corps was formally charged by the United States government for river management, flood management. They didn't do away with the levees. They felt like the levee system, as we well know in Katrina, you know, there were still levees down in, in New Orleans. But what they decided to do was let's concentrate on developing catch basins. Let's concentrate on, on finding a way to catch spring rains so we can slowly let them go into the river system and thereby eliminate some of the flooding. Great idea. Even a better idea because Kentucky being situated where it is was perfect for those flood control lakes. And many of Kentucky State Parks are located on Corps of Engineer flood control lakes. Rock River's one, Barren River's one, No Land's one. Uh, I mean, there's, you can just go down, Ken, uh, not, not Ken K, uh, Taylorsville. A lot of them are located on flood control lakes. And so the state parks took very much advantage of that. And we grew tremendously during that period of time and opened up that. As for Rough River itself, we came into 
Uh, yeah. The mo you say you've got some of the original plans for the lake. What's amazed me is the, when Rough River was built and the Corps of Engineers turned it over to the state to run, they originally intended for all 9,234 acres of shoreline to be ceded to the state park system. The original campground was supposed to be where Patriots Point worked. Up there on right across from where our beach is, you look up on that bluff, that's where the original campground was supposed to be. In the original thought or pre-planning for the park. Well, early on, Kentucky very wisely said, eh, a little bit more than we handled. And so it was drawn back to the acreage that it is now. But uh, it was kind of, in 1965, uh, of course, uh, there was a supplemental agreement for some more acreage there. We developed uh, the, what is now 600, we supposedly 637 acres that we manage. Because we actually own, the state owns about 37 acres across the road. Uh, it's not core property, it's state owned property. But the state park officially became part of the state park system in 1961, but the lodge was not open until 1962. Um, through the years we've added the marina. It was originally opened with only 24 rooms. And there weren't any cottages originally built, but they were built very shortly after that. Uh, it has enjoyed some great periods of growth. The park, in the short period of time, we were talking about this house being really neat because it's got good bones. And if, if, a, if, an art, if a house has got good bones, then you, know, you can work with it. You can restore it. Our park is the same way. That park's got good bones. It's, it's a nice park. It's just not been treated very well for, in my opinion, for a period of time. So we're, we're looking to try to take this park back to where it was before. But during a period of 1960 to 1963, they were adding stuff. Um, they were adding things all through the park. We, we actually now have 17 cottages. We're, some of them were built during that time. We were, had been helped through the years by different revenue bonds that have been issued that have really helped us grow. Uh, federal grants that have helped us grow. We were able to get the Nine Holes Golf Course out there and expanding our camping facility all because of periods of time there were grants that were issued or, or things that were done by the state. But the park itself was finally renovated in its present condition uh, back in 1996 and 97. And many of you may realize or remember that. We added the conference center. It was completed. Uh, we renovated some more cottages. We changed the lobby. The lobby used to be a lot different than what it was. Those of you that have been here for a while previous to me, know that uh, the lobby was rearranged. We rearranged the gift shop where the lobby is, the elevator going down to the dining room, and added a lot of stuff there. So that, but that's really the last major work that was done, and that was in the mid to late 90s. Uh, early on, though, the really cool thing about the park, there are three state parks with airfields, only three. There's Barkley, and there's Kentucky Dam Village, and there's us. We, our airfield, was an afterthought. When they were building the dam, there was a lot of what they call spoil or scrap that would have had to have been landscaped over. So they said, let's don't landscape over it, build an airfield. And so, thinking ahead, they built an airfield. And it's, it's a 3,200 foot strip. And it is, it's unlike the other two, you can walk from our strip to the park which is a great advantage to have out there. The park itself is, is a, it's a nice, nice park. I have traveled many of the state parks, and I am, uh, I am very proud and very pleased to be part of that state park. It is an asset to this whole area, and we're going to be doing a lot of whatever we can do to, uh, to bring it back to some of its former glory. But where do state parks go from now? on out. You know, there's 50 state parks, 17 resort parks, and 33 recreation or historical parks. We cover about 45,000 acres of Kentucky in our state parks. We still employ about 1,800 people 
which in the whole scheme of state employees is less than one, per, one half of one percent, I think. But uh, 1,800 employees to cover full-time employees. Of course, we ramp up in the summertime with part-time help. Uh, but we operate on a budget of about $90 million a year. We're still growing strong, but you know, there's, we're beginning to show our age. There's some things that, uh, that need to be happening in the future. One of the things we have done, and parks or haven't done, is we haven't really sold our, told our story very well. Um, are state parks self-sufficient? I ask that question, do anybody know? A lot of people believe that state parks pay for themselves, that they're self-sufficient. That ain't the case. I don't have enough rooms out there that I can sell in the summertime to help me make it through the wintertime. And it's the same way at every other park except Carmelin Falls, Kentucky Dam Village, and Barkley. Those parks are close to breaking even. One of them does actually make a profit. But the rest of the parks, especially if you look at historical parks, and you look at the recreation parks, there's no way you're ever going to make money. But what we do is we make 62% of our operating, 62% of our costs are covered by our operating income, or our revenue, income and revenue, which is outside of fish and wildlife, who gets to find everybody, anybody they want. I mean, you know, heck, they run out of money, they just go out and find somebody fishing somewhere and they give them a ticket, <laughs> confiscate their boat and sell it. <laughs> They're a cash cow. I mean, that's, that's a license to print money there. But uh, outside of that, we, we do very well. But in the last biennial budget, the portion that the legislature provides us to operate on was cut by 17%. In this proposed budget, it's cut another 8.2%, which I didn't go to MIT, but that's over 25% of cut in funding in over two budgetary time periods. So it does leave us with some questions. There was a, the state of Kentucky hired a few years ago a consulting firm to come in called Pros to take a look at the state park system. They wanted to see what we could do to move this state park system forward and to, quote, bring it into profitability. But one of the things that they said, they found out, was, or they recommended, having dealt with a lot of state park systems across the nation, is that a park system of our size and that many facilities should have a maintenance, I mean a maintenance budget for repair and improvement of facilities of about $25 million a year. That's just to restore, replace, and repair major repairs. You know, little repairs we take care of with park budget, but I'm talking major, like coming in and redoing cottages or remodeling the lodge or things like that. The state parks, Kentucky State Parks, get 5.5 .5 million spread over two years. So that's what we had to work with in keeping, yeah, my. Mike Swatsina is head of facilities management in Frankfurt, and I wouldn't have his job. They couldn't pay me to have his job because he's all the time getting called. Well, my furnace broke down here. And the, 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 you can imagine that takes a drain out there. But that doesn't stop us from doing what we need to do because we're looking to different ways to get it there. The state parks have started forming in the community around them. Remember, the genesis of state parks. The very first state park came as a result of what? Came as a result of a gift from the people of Belkin. That was the first state park. So now people are rallying to state parks. I'll give you a couple of examples. The Audubon Museum up in Henderson. Again, you need to go there sometime. Um, not all of the artwork that was in the museum it was owned by the museum. It was loaned to the museum by the family. They were going to sell it. They were going to auction it, which would have meant a huge hit to the Audubon Museum. The people of Henderson got together, and they had a friends group already, and they rallied and raised money and raised $1.5 million and purchased that rest of that collection and donated it back to the museum. That total collection now is worth over $13.5 million of the Audubon collection that's at that museum on James J. Audubon. Uh, on even a smaller scale, a friend of mine, Peter Bowles, is the uh, manager down in Penrout. His group out of Dawson Springs, Kentucky, big city of Dawson Springs, 
Uh, they have a friends group in that area, and they buy all the plants for the park. They help plan them. They do the landscape planning because they believe the park needs to look beautiful. It needs to look like a state park. We have a friends group that we're that is starting to get really rolling up there, and we're and we're always open to volunteers. That's how we make it through the rough periods of time. Now, the future of the state parks, we have dedicated employees. I can guarantee you this. For a lot of us, it's not a job. To me, it's a second career. I'm having a ball. I mean, you spend 30 years in the corporate world. If I was still there, I'd probably be dead on my desk. I mean, come on. <laughs> my office overlooks the lake. I get to look out my office window, and I'm looking at the lake like every day. I say, this is a, this is a terrible gig, you know. I just don't know how to do this job. But a lot of people, it's not a job. It's a calling. We're intent on making sure the people that visit our park have the best time that they can possibly have, and that we do whatever we can to keep the park system going. I'm going to read you one thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get out of your way here. When, the, when originally Dr. Gilson, uh, he expanded on what he thought the state parks could mean and why Kentucky should have a state park system. He said, mere words can never adequately describe the many points of natural beauty in Kentucky. The striking contrasts in nature cannot be forced within the covers of a book. The vastness of the great outdoors, the infinite detail of each physical component, the myriad forms of life, the exquisiteness and adaption of each organism, the soul-uplifting silence of a primeval forest, the fleeting liquid note of a passing songster, these and a thousand other wonderful experiences await the lover of nature in the wilderness. Here are the natural parks awaiting state custodianship. Their acquisition and preservation by the Commonwealth constitute a service in which may, we may all unite in with pride and enthusiasm. That's your state park system, and it's one of the finest in the nation, and we bill ourselves as one of the nation's finest, and we need it. We do it. So I'm certainly open for questions, and I thank you very much for the time. Any questions? <laughs> I think you covered it all pretty well. Yeah. Well, I hope I didn't overstay my welcome. That's a little bit. Like I say, I'm more of an advocate. We appreciate you coming here. Well, I've mentioned. What was that? Natural Bridge Park that helps out. What is it? Just, <laughs> just being there. You mentioned Wickliffe Mound State. Is this state park? Yes, Wickliffe Mound is a there. state park. It was one. It's one of the newer state parks. It's the 50s on the side on here. Um, actually, we had one drop off. Ben Hawes was a state park, and it was recently transferred back to the city of Owensboro, actually the Davis County Parks System, but. Uh, Looking, I can give you the exact date. Um, yeah, Wycliffe Mounds came on. Oh, yeah, Wycliffe Mounds was very early on. Um, you ever been to Wycliffe before? No, uh, I'm part of the, the local Boy Scouts on the Scouts, uh -huh. and we're talking about going down there. It's a great place. Um, does it have camping facilities? I, I tell you what. The easiest way to do that is go on parks.ky.gov. And I do not think that they have camping I don't think they do this. I, don't think, I was down there a year ago, and it changed a lot. Oh, 25, 30 years ago when I was down there, they had the burial mounds where you went in the building, yeah. and you could see the layers. Yeah, well, I, I didn't know that it had changed. And now, I mean, because of, you know, the burial mounds, they have closed it. I mean, yeah. you can see the top soil, but you don't see like you did before. Oh, you can't see down the side. You can't of see. Mind. You can't see. No, you can't see the skeleton. I think Native oh, Americans. Uh, have, uh, it was I mean, years if, ago. Is any of voice scout group somewhere? Or to be seen to the you bottom. It's got replicas of things in yeah. there, but you will not see no real bones or anything. Yeah. I thought it used to. It had a glass floor where you could see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Native Americans have. Changed it. Put this, that yeah. Well, they're not even Native Americans. Anyway, they're Hopewell. They're white. I mean, it's from way before the written. But that's a different There's not a whole lot to see. We went on down to Columbus, and we really enjoyed the Columbus. Columbus, come on. I think that's a pretty good place. Uh, we uh, made the trip, went down to Columbus, and we come back up there because I've been for years. If you've never been, think about the lip. Yeah.
is one of the coolest places I've been. And uh, they, in the September, they have what they call a salt festival. It's a weekend where they, they bring in all centered in that 1810 to 1830 time period, reenactors, soap makers, blacksmiths, uh, and all sorts of, and then it's, it's a great, great festival. It, they really tied in well with all the schools up there. So if you go, I go on Saturday because all the schools go on yeah. Friday from up there. But it's, it's great. And plus, the park's wonderful, too. The museum's cool. Uh, which one's that you're talking about? Big Bone Lick State Park. It's right, it's a suburb of Rabbit Hatch. You ever been to Rabbit Hatch, Kentucky? No. I'm in the eastern part of Kentucky. You've been to Rabbit Hatch? Rabbit Hatch? Oh, yeah. Mayor of Rabbit Hatch is a dog, right? Yeah. Yep. The natural Bridge yeah. is pretty. I've been there twice. Natural Bridge is pretty. Blue Lick is Carlisle. Nicholas County, mm -hmm. right in your area. I couldn't, right off the top of my head, I don't know. It's fairly close up to the county. There is a state park I used to live up in Birmingham, and I'm pretty sure that that's right outside of Nicholas County, Carlisle. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Doesn't give me the, the county. Yeah. I think that's not quite sure. Looking on the map, that's fairly close to the Mount Sterling area. I've still got a lot of things. I just went to Cumberland for the first time last week for a manager's meeting. I've never been there. We've never been to the, the park, like the Mount Sterling Park. Yeah. 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 The park, like the facilities, but the voice has welfare, and we go rafting. We go to you know, private here. But we got a chance to go to Buffalo State Park last year. I've never been up there. I mean, you can see your talking news ahead of there. Oh, yeah. Uh, my husband wants to go back. Yeah, that's how it's it. At that period of time I went up there, they were having all the forest fires in the Red River area there. You know, the whole area is kind of blanketed with smoke, which made it really eerie anyway. Yeah. But you go through Natural Bridge, or at least I did, to get over there. And I'm driving up the side of the mountain, trying to get the buckhorn, and there's a tree on fire next to the road. Really to <laughs> but I get up there, and it opens up a cool place. But I mean, you got to want to go there. I came back here and I told our group sales coordinator, I said, if they can get people like Bob there, I want this place full every week. You got no excuse. Because we're, we're an hour from Lumber, an hour from Louisville, and an hour from Bowling Green. We're a perfect place for a state park.